Okay, so we'll go ahead and get started. We've got almost everybody here except for apparently people. Um, so today we're going to be talking about automation and report. Before that, we've got a couple of things to go through and then we'll get to the actual course content. So you may have noticed in your name tag that there's a bunch of extra papers. So the various papers are your name tag, the sort of post class survey, anonymous survey. So you'll notice a lot of the things in the class are anonymous, and that's like by design, right? So don't put your name on the review sheet. Basically, there's what you knew, what you didn't know, and what you want to know, but didn't learn during this class. So those are the feedback sessions. So during class, if there's something that hits you, just like write it down, and then at the end, we'll collect that. The other two sheets are someone else's homework. They're also anonymous, and that I know whose homework they are, but you don't. And someone has, hopefully, your homework. So that's nice. Okay. <laughs> Hopefully that works. Uh, so what you have in front of you is someone else's homework and someone has yours. So the goal of this exercise is that we're going to review that person's homework according to a set of questions that I have for you. You will take a pen, and if you don't have a pen, I've got a couple up here, and write answers to those questions about their homework on their homework. And so that way, we're going to do this shuffle twice that they don't know who reviewed them, and you don't know whose homework you reviewed. It's a little bit of a logistic nightmare, but we'll get through it. <laughs> so, so you have two homeworks. You should. Hopefully. Sorry. There's one homework assignment, but two copies from two different authors. Right, two different authors. Um, and so here are the questions that I would request that you respond to about their homework. So basically, you have to act as, we're not going to give out the grades, but we're going to view it as though we wanted to compile the program. Would that work out? If it doesn't work out in your mind, why not? Right? If, it, if it's well-written code, can you comment on what you like about it? Or if it's crap code, talk about that. Right? So hopefully, like the ideal world, is someone else will provide as constructive evidence as you are producing for someone else. So that's, that's the challenge of, <laughs> if you write crappy comments and are not very helpful to someone else, they can do the same to you, but you just won't know who it is. That's the problem. Right? So try and like be a good person, I guess. Take my message. So I'm going to give you a few minutes. I'll walk around. If you have questions about these questions or questions about the code you have in front of you, I'm walking around so that I can help you. Like, you'll see something, and you're like, what is that going on? Like, That's what I'm here for. No, 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 no. So, this is for the end of class. The homeworks are going to be for your activity right now. Thank you for the clarification. There's a lot of paper shuffling around. <laughs> yeah. I don't expect that, that much paper in the table signs. Absolutely, I know, right? It's terrible. Dead trees everywhere. Yes, I will. I will. How do you feel about catching? <laughs> nice, nice, nice. So close. Sorry. Thank you. I don't have an exercise for you, but we're doing exercise. Also, you'll need this. Sorry. All right. Also, please write legibly so that other people can read what you wrote. <laughs> I think a baseline requirement. <laughs> And you do have two different assignments from two different authors. 
This approach was not what I was intending. Basically, special characters because the original game account had been converted because it's like in XML. In XML you might have a name for the And in HTML they have a thing that looks like a href. And so when that code in HTML was put into the XML, it was the converter replaced all these this Ampersand. So then, what this <laughs> I would probably not do it this way. It solves the problem. And then, right, exactly. So, so they didn't actually parse the XML, but they converted the HTML to HTML. It was all different. It ended up working, but it wasn't right. Well, elementary tree, if you don't specify the parser, is there any default parser? So you can go like parse documents without specification. Ah, uh, because they're using a library called XML you know, Eater. Right. So that is the XML program. So you were, I think you were, if I remember right, just using beautiful soup. So you need to specify. Why? Here they're using a separate dedicated library for it. No, but I actually use this one. I changed it. Ah, okay. So originally you were using the LXM. Yeah. Yeah. But uh, I think they have like two different parts of that. Right, that's fine. That's no, parser is.
I don't want you to create one from scratch. But you should definitely use the module or so you should use someone else's code. That was the goal. No, but this says do not break. I didn't want you to keep I didn't I did not want you to invent it. Yeah, this one. Yeah, You always have to write a duplicate. Yeah, yeah. So, so you can start with a duplicate. Right. Are we allowed to check to see if this works? <laughs> if you want to run the code, you can yeah. retype it on your computer, I guess. Sure. Okay. So, how many people would like two more minutes? Is that useful? Yeah, that's why you need a pen now. You have a pen? Okay, yeah. So, I want you to write on the paper. So, what do I the Yes, all of these questions. That's why you're, you're in this folder, so you're moving over and you're inside one HTML. Okay, so we'll take two more minutes. Uh, so if you haven't started on the second author's code, please review it. Uh, we'll finish up and then we'll do this shuffle.
There's like a 30 second warning. Just finish up last comments, um, and we'll get to the next next phase. Then that's fine. It's always. <laughs> Or maybe you could write what you learned from their code, if you learned something. All right, so the next phase of the game. So there are two numbers on the top of your of each of your uh, papers in red. One is labeled as mid, and the other is labeled as end. So what you're going to do is the two pieces of paper you have, you're going to identify what is the number of mid on each of those assignments, and you're going to find the person who has that number. So I will reveal to you the lookup table for that number. So, so, find, so find the person who has the mid number and give the paper to them. <laughs> it's called a lookup table. It's a game. Again, the, the number for the mid. We will not move on until everyone has completed this phase. <laughs> Okay, we still have a few people struggling, so so at this point, how are we doing? I didn't get a sheet. You did not get a sheet. What? Right, so you don't, so, so if you're, if you have a number on here, you should have two pieces of paper with mid and your name, right here, the number that you have. How are we doing? Or who the hell are you going up there? Okay. Okay, so so now, okay, so we've got it matched up. You're still missing one? Yeah, I think one one person should be missing one. Um, do you have to deliver it to the mid person? Yes. Yeah. Okay, so, so once you have the mid and your name on the paper, is everybody, who's, who's here is not good so far? Everybody's happy? You're waiting? You don't have anything? My name is not in the... Ah, yeah. So it's, <laughs> you were neglected. <laughs> All right. Not sure what happened to your home. Maybe I didn't print it. Might be the issue. Okay, I'm just waiting for these guys up here. Are you guys good? Okay. So... So now we're going to do this, the third step. So you don't have your homework, and you don't have the person who you looked at homework. So you are you are basically the middleman, or the middle woman in this case. Okay. So now we're going to have another lookup table, and you can sort of hope where this is going, right? You're going to give the homework to the person with the number for. End. So look in the paper that you have. Look at the number that says end, and then turn in the paper to that person. Huh? Yes, do that. <laughs> Action command. Exactly. Huh? Who is it? You, so you get, now you have yours or not? So someone should give you some paper. 
Okay, good. I agree. It is confusing. Look at the end. Whose name is it? Give the paper to that person. <laughs> okay, so when you're done, take your seat. Sorry. <laughs> okay. Okay, so now at this point, you, the end person, should have your homework. Huh? Yes? Huh? Okay, okay. So you should have your homework. We have one missing. Great. So now you should have your homework. It should have comments on it from someone who you don't know. Yeah? Good. All right. So we're going to move on because there's a lot to cover in this class, but uh, <laughs> that's basically the collaboration that I was looking for. Okay. So thank you. Now I do have a question. And this is like legitimate curiosity. I do not remember. Have I, in this course, I think during week one, stated what the collaboration policy is? For homeworks before the submission. Mm. No. Uh, I think you said do not collaborate. Okay. Did anyone else hear that? No collaboration. I think you said specifically you assume that we are we are like an island. We're like John Dunn, and we are a man, you know, island to us, into and of ourselves, and only access to Google, right? Yes. So so <laughs> access to Google, Google access to Ben, and no other students. So yeah. how many? Who here heard that? Did anyone? Two, okay. Somehow the front row heard that. Okay. <laughs> okay. So the reason that's important is it will come up later. But um, so I just wanted to reaffirm because I I didn't see where in the slides I said that explicitly, and I didn't have a recording of week one. But that, I just wanted to check on that. So thank you. We've got at least five people saying yes. All right. So there's a. We're not halfway through the semester. We're about a third of the way. So. All right. If I can get your attention, I know the activity was fun. Everybody, slide. So this is something you care about, which is project one. So, so your presentation, which you need to prepare because you might be randomly selected to present, right? Maybe you're not confident about how that's going. That's totally understandable. It's the first project. So the consequences, you should uh, look at the rubric, email me, and set up an in-person meeting. So we have plenty of time before Wednesday next week. That's when the presentations are in class. So the other thing is to sort of like note about project one is that I'm not looking for PowerPoint slides. I do not want you to write a Jupyter notebook and then compose PowerPoint slides. I actually want you to present your Jupyter notebook. So that's what you'll be showing in means the visualizations, the writing the code. You'll be explaining verbally what it is you did. Right? I know it's crazy, right? All right. Um, and then, so the other observation is there are some cables up here. So the options are you can plug into these cables. They're VGA and HDMI. The other option is you can email me your Jupyter notebook, and then I will project it on my computer because I certainly have connectors. So those are your options for um, for showing your presentation. Um, not everyone is going to get called in class. We'll do a random selection. Right. So, yeah, April, question? Please tell me this there are only Oh, that is a, mm, is that true? So. <laughs> uh, no, it's not. It's not true. No. Yeah, it's true. Oh, really? <laughs> right. So, yes, there is homework. I do remember. Thank you. <laughs> all right. I, I, I literally want to teach you all the data science I know. Like, that is my literal goal. And I, I, all right. If I can get your attention. I, I, I do need to keep going, but I will wait for you to stop. <laughs> I know it's super tempting in back to just keep talking. That's cool. All right. So now we're actually going to start it on. So this, before we move on, does anyone have any questions on week one? I mean, if you have questions, it's a great time because then everyone will know the answer. So we just basically present what we find out from data. Yeah. Some visualization charts and stuff like that. Yep. So that's really okay. That's right. All right. 
are we considering? Do we want to do any like preliminary like modeling on it? Or are we going to have any sort of progression on it? Just, just characterization. <laughs> There is no constraint, right? Like, whatever we learn, all these COVID, we can apply those. And things you've learned outside of class. Yeah, so like, what are you expecting? Like, can we know what you're expecting from this? Yes. If you look at the rubric, yeah. how I wonder <laughs> if it is on the rubric. <laughs> 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 yeah, it's not very clear. Yeah, it's not very clear. What's missing? <laughs> What's missing? <laughs> what are you politically expecting from what you do? Okay. <laughs> Well, I'll tell you what, if, if there's something specific about the rubric that's not clear, let me know. That's what, that's how I'm grading. I guess just need to know how far you want us to go. So you just want us to look. So the, the late, I, I advocate the lazy approach, right? The lazy approach is meet the requirements on the rubric and stop. Do not invest 10 weeks of time in the next week, right? <laughs> just do the project, meet the requirements on the rubric. If you have questions about the rubric or how, I, how you think you do or do not want to include something, ask me. We really haven't gone over EDA here. I will disagree with that. <laughs> <laughs> so, I, counter examples the bowling data. Okay. Yeah. So, we did the, what was the, other one? the book, baseball data. Yeah. Right. We looked at the uh, loan data. So, I, I have intentionally sprinkled out EDA throughout the class. The notebooks are posted. I mean, you could be as lazy as copy pasting and citing from Ben's notes. I mean, like, that's, that's a good thing, right? I want you to be lazy. This shouldn't be harder than a homework. It's less structured than a homework, but it shouldn't be harder than a homework. All right, <laughs> I'll move on. <laughs> all right, so so all about automation. Automation is about being lazy, if you sense a theme going on in my life. All right, so the typical response when you show up, oh, wait, I actually have one more story. So we did a code review. Has anyone here participated in a code review outside of class? Two, three, three, okay, good. So I have a really depressing story from today from work, and like this is it, it just it was a coincidence that it worked out today. But I've been I've been writing thousands of lines of Python scripts for the past few months to collect a bunch of data from a bunch of sensors. So then today we found out that there was a bug in my code. It was a very one line bug, but it rendered every single data point we've ever collected invalid. So that was months months of collection and and code writing with one bug. And so there's a bunch of things that we could have done to not have this problem, but you know what the number one solution would have been? It's, it's pretty straightforward to implement, but takes a lot of time. Well, not no, code review, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> we did code review. So it, in class, we did code review, but I typically don't write code that gets reviewed by anyone else. And so that bug would be very obvious to anyone else reading the code, or if I had read the code to someone. And so just like the relevance of code review is very high. The problem is you're not typically working with a bunch of peers who are willing to take the time to read your code and offer commentary back on it. So that hit me very close to home today. All right, now I'm back on track automation. <laughs> <laughs> so the typical response when, when, when there's a bunch of work, the business response is to hire more people. That's totally understandable, especially interns. Interns are free and you don't know what they can do, so maybe they can do magic. I right? think that's the optimistic approach. But the problem is, even if you have free labor, right, it still costs you. You have to basically care and feed for it, right? You have to give it office space. You have to give it a computer. Right? You have to give it attention. You have to give it data. All these things that your free labor consumes, right, it makes it actually not free, even when you're not paying for it. So hopefully today we offer you a way out of that. All right. So if you don't have access to labor, or you have to do it yourself for whatever reason. This is a typical workflow for a beginner, right? Like, I open up a notebook, I run the notebook, I look at the document, I get the data, I put it in the notebook, and then I write up a PDF and I email it to the customer. That is like a totally reasonable approach, but I want today to break every step here. I want to get rid of every manual task on this list. So that's a lot, right? We've got Word documents, we've got data flows, we've got report generation. All of that can be automated so that you don't have to do it every every week, every day, right? That's a good thing. So that's that's the value hopefully today. So I want you to be able to generate web pages, PDFs, websites, send emails, text messages from Jupyter, Python, I and mean, that's cool, right? I think it is. <laughs> 
So, so we're not here today just you know inventing automation. It came from somewhere. So I'm <laughs> I'm gonna dig back to my roots, right? Like manual labor. That's the thing that we used to do. But you're a data scientist, so we're gonna avoid that. We're all gonna be on computers. That's a good thing. All right. So the the key thing that's consistent throughout history is that there's a lot of repetitive tasks. And we invented machines to do that, but before we had machines, we had people doing things. Right? And that involved both manual labor, but also calculations and data analysis. So just like we had field workers, we had computers. But before we had actual electromechanical or electrical computers, we had people who were called computers. So are you guys aware of that history? Yeah. No? OK. So, so a computer referred to a person. That was their title. They computed things. Right, and so, so this is the computing division. It's all women. They do math all day. That's what they do. So, so, so the, the trick here, like how could you get away with this? Was it because you could take really complicated math operations, decompose them into simple operations, and then do a lot of simple operations. That's the same thing your computer on your desktop does, right? You take a bunch of complex operations, decompose them into little instructions with ones and zeros, and then make a bunch of manipulations. But if you don't have like a little Intel chip, you have this. OK, so if, if you're not aware of the history, there's a really great movie. I watched it when it came out. This is something that you should watch for some like, historical context. So typically, they, the large scientific institutions hired lots of women. And this is a movie about uh, uh, progressive black women who were at NASA doing computations to send people to the moon. Because in order to do all those calculations, we had to give it to someone to do manually. All right, so that's a good movie to watch. All right, so we've gotten a little far from that, right? We have these computers on our desktop. They do amazing things, and we take them for granted. Um, and they're actually beating out humans on a lot of tasks, which to me is a great thing. I don't want to do tasks that are, are hard and like, repetitive. But here's an example. So this is Gary Kasparov, famous, world-famous chess champion. Chess is a very hard game to play. And it was thought that humans could play chess, but computers couldn't because it was so complicated. Right, but 1997, a human was defeated playing chess. And that has like, that's, that's going on. And, and, and now I've got like AlphaGo from Google, right? So we're, we're, we're advancing the games that computers can beat humans at. That was something that I don't think anyone would have predicted, you know, back when we had human computers. All right. So I want to break off and do a little bit of uh, discussion at this time. So is that a good thing, right? That's basically the question. Automation is a tool, and, and hopefully you all read the article that was posted, and a reminder was done today. Um, so I want you to pair off. I'm going to give you some randomly selected partners. Let's see. Yeah, yeah. I'm all about random. All right. So this is a collab notebook. Uh, right. Are these the new partners? Are those new partners for everybody? Let's make it a little bigger. Yeah, that's nice. Awesome. Same? Okay. It's convenience. All right. So partner up. If neither of you read the article, just raise your hand and I'll tell you what the article is about. <laughs> Do you have a partner? But you both did not read the article. <laughs>
Come back to our desk. Okay, so, so why would I have you talk about the ethics of automation? I'm gonna be I'm gonna be arming you with some very powerful tools. Tools that most other people haven't even thought that they exist. Right. So when you tell someone I can automate your task, that will blow their mind because they didn't even think that that was possible. Right. And so there's some ethics involved in that conversation. I'm going to spend the rest of class basically talking about the different technologies. But I wanted to warm you up thinking about the fact that it's not just a technology. It also impacts how people conduct their lives. So that was my motive for doing that. So I'll put you on break until 7.55, 7.56. So let's take a break.
All right, so we'll get started again. All right, so we're going to go through a little bit more fluff and then we'll get to the technical stuff. So the, the task that we've answered is sort of like, what's the history? And now we're going to talk about who is it that we're referring to about the automation, who does that apply to? So the easy answer we've already discovered is ourselves, right? If there's repetitive tasks we're doing, then obviously those should be uh, automated. And we'll talk about all those different things. The other aspect is other people. This one's way more challenging. And there's a bit of psychology as to why it's so hard. Right. So, so it's useful to go and talk to other people and help them automate their tasks. That's my first claim. If there are, so let's say you're in a business setting and you're the new data scientist who just showed up, right? No one knows who you are. They don't even know your name. They certainly don't know what you're capable of, right? And you're just, you're being toured around the office, right? So what I recommend is when you're talking to people and you learn what is your job, what do you do every day? Is that repetitive, right? You're asking sort of leading questions to see, oh, can I provide you value? And that's the, that's the sort of curiosity with an intent, right? So you're talking to people and asking them, what do you do every day? That's a very straightforward question, but it tells you how can I add value by helping you be more effective, right? That's the name. So the cold start basically is like, how do you demonstrate value by providing value to people, right? Like you have to figure out what it is that would be valuable to them. So if you can help them automate, that's a good thing. It's also a really um, dangerous thing, right? So like if you're automating their task, which is the motives for the homework this week, there's a couple of different dangers. So the dangers of offering other people help is twofold. One is they start sending you trivial tasks. They're just like, this is boring and stupid, and I can't automate it, but you know, I'm trying to provide value, so try to avoid that loop. The other loop, though, that's much more common is that when you show up, you're a data scientist. You're smart. You went to school. You have all these programming skills. We heard you know math. Right? <laughs> and that makes you a, a threat, right? Someone, so imagine someone has been in the office for 15 or 20 years, They've been doing the same job. They're pretty comfortable, right? They got paid. They know what they're doing. When they wake up every morning, they know exactly what's going to happen. And that's very comfortable. So you represent a threat. Your threat that you show up with is, I'm going to change what you do every day. That's scary. People are scared of you threatening their livelihood, right? They're scared of changing what they have to do every day. The unknown is very uncertain, right? So, so those are things that people will fight you on. They want to do that repetitive job. It's safe. They know what they're doing, right? When you take away that repetition, it means they have to learn something new. That's, that's very scary. So what you think of as providing value, they see as a threat. And they will fight you every inch. They won't give you a computer. They certainly won't give you data, right? We went over there. And, and do they want to help you? Absolutely not, right? So like, and you're like, I'm trying to help. Like, aren't we on the same, we're on the same business, we're paid by the same boss, and they'll still fight you. So that's just a little heads up. If you know it's coming, it's easier to sort of like sidestep it or address it directly. If you don't see it coming, you'll be confounded. You'll be like, what is going on here? All right. So that's just like this little psychology part. All right. So how, do, how does automation actually work? Like, what's the fundamental theory going on here? Like, how, does, how do we accomplish this value? And basically, what I'm going to make the claim is that Abstraction is the trick. So abstraction means you're taking something complicated and you're making it more simple. And now you're taking a bunch of tasks that are a collection of simple things that's complicated, then you're making that simple. So every time you're sort of like reducing the complexity by adding in this abstraction layer. So what does that actually mean? All right. So remember back in the day, we had these huge computer banks, um, which were electromechanical, right? Or just uh, run with circuit relays that you had to like reprogramming the computer and rewiring it physically. So that's the thing that happened. Um, it's how computers started out. This was what replaced that room full of women doing math. So you'll notice who's running the computer, by the way. Women. Just, that's, that's fine, right? 
they're actually the troubleshooters and the programmers, because the programmers who have been doing all the math for now programming the computer by rewiring it, right? Man, men with their big hands and like they're not very delicate, hurt the computer, right? Women are much better at that. <laughs> yeah. At least that was the thing. And I agree with it. All right. So this is a thing people had to do. It was a full-time job programming the computer to put in little applications by rewiring the type drive computer. So what happened after that? Well, the computers got smaller, right? And so basically, this whole sequence of like, how did we get to today is building on the knowledge that we have, making things simpler, right? So we went from rewiring the computer to just changing a little electrical switches, basically. That's how we got the transist uh, transistors. And so now we got um, the smaller, it's faster, and it doesn't require a room full of women to program the computer. So it made their job go away. Notice that threat model? We just eliminated a bunch of hiring, which is great for business, right? We've saved a bunch of money. We've sped things up. We've also threatened a, like, a livelihood. Right. So back in the day, we didn't get to use programming languages. We had to work with mach machine code and assembly, right? And that's how computers are programmed. Now, that's way better than moving wires around on a big panel. Right? So that's an improvement in some sense. We've, we've abstracted away the idea. We've made our programs actually in memory. But we've gotten away from that. Right? So we got away from that by having this high-level language called C. It's not actually high-level. It's just high-level compared to assembly. Right? So we don't have to move around individual places in memory, but we have these things that we have like loops and print statements. And like this is way more beautiful than the assembly that one would have to normally program it. So we abstracted away the programming into this high-level language. It's not actually high-level compared to Python. Python's way easier to use. You don't have to worry about memory management. All that is sort of like hidden and obfuscated by like Python running C programs in the background. Right? So again, you've hidden the complexity of memory management with your high-level language of Python. So that's cool. Right? And then we have <laughs> layers on top of that. We don't even use Python anymore in machine learning. We just call these giant libraries like TensorFlow. You don't have to learn programming. You can just call a library. It's way easier. So every time, notice what's happening. We're obfuscating some complexity, making things simpler. But the, the little trick here is that every time you add an abstraction layer, debugging anything in the layers above, or however you want to think about flow, gets way harder. Right? As long as your problem works here, it's easier. But if your problem occurred back up here, Debugging that up here is hard. So abstraction layers definitely add value, but they make debugging harder if you have hard problems to solve. All right. So I don't expect you to come up with an abstraction layer. That's not the point of the class. <laughs> the point is that um, I want you to identify repetitive tasks. Right? Why would I want to do that? I want to make you more effective. I don't want you to be typing the same code in every day. Right? Just write a script to do that. So basically, this is where your value is. Um, I think that this will make me more powerful. All right. So now we've done the who and the how. I don't really get the what. So question for you guys. And I'll ask a uh, you know, pen here. Right. So how do you exchange information with stakeholders? This, this sounds unrelated, but it's a, it's a segue. How do you exchange data with stakeholders? Stakeholders are people like customers. Data to management. How do you do that? Profits. Hmm? profits. Uh, do you exchange profits with like the you know uh, stakeholders and the main stakeholders? You show it as to whether what to stay for. And how do you show them? Through graphs, plotting, something like that. And presented in what format? Yeah. PowerPoint. Yeah, maybe. PowerPoint. Okay, PowerPoint. Right. So I would communicate. The profits and the business report in PowerPoint. Who else? Another one? Images. What was Pictures. In what format? Email. Email. Yeah, well, that's a good one. Okay. 
Yes. Yeah. Has anyone ever called and talked to their customer? Um, MP3, like audio files. How, how, in what format would that get to your safe folder? Would you hand them an MP3 file? Um, <laughs> And you, you actually have to get, I mean, yes, I can represent data in an MP3 file, but I have to get it through that tomorrow, right? Right. Okay. Google Docs. Google Docs, all right. That's, I like that one, Google Docs. Yeah, okay. Anything else? Facts. Those are good. Who here has used a fax machine? Just out of curiosity. <laughs> <laughs> got one? Anyone else? Come on. All right. All right. So, so all of this, basically, we're looking for ways to communicate with our customers. Why is that relevant? All right. So I tried to capture. Let's see if we missed something. Email. Or, oh yeah. Obviously, you have in-person meetings, right? Like that's important. Okay. Web. I would throw those on there. All right. These are the way that we exchange data. So why are we enumerating this whole list? The problem is. You know all these things. I, I have faith in you. You know how to use these tools. But if you don't know how to automate them, then you're limited to making a PDF and sending it to someone. You're limited to sending as many emails as you can type. Right? That's not how we do things in data science. We try and not make sure that the humans develop. So the point is, you know these different tools, but my desire for you is to learn how do you make it scalable? How would you send 10,000 emails in an hour? Can anyone do that right now? Hmm? Mail merge. OK, mail merge. Nice. Does anyone here know what mail merge is besides Cam? All right, so mail merge is a way of taking your Excel document of all the email addresses you have or in a, in a Word document and then sending that through Outlook. So this is like a very nice way that Office has automated the process of sending tens of thousands of custom emails. It's a cool thing to learn about if you haven't done that. All right. So typically, what we're sending to customers is like discrete little drops of information. PDFs, MP3 files, I guess I go with. <laughs> like you're sending them in a, a chart, typically an Excel document, a web page, whatever it is, right? So if you, if you realize, I have all these channels I communicate with the people on, and I have the things that I deliver to the people. If I can automate both those aspects, then I'm going to be able to interact with as many people as frequently as I want in whatever format customized, right? That is the, where you deliver value. <laughs> right. But what you know how to do right now is Python notebooks. And let me tell you, your customers, your manager, your coworkers, they don't know Jupyter. So if you say, hey, I, you know, I made this great analysis that analyzes all the data. It's huge, right? It doesn't fit in your Excel spreadsheet. <laughs> right? Like, no one cares. They, 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 you will email them the Jupyter Notebook, and they'll open up and be like, this is, I don't even recognize this. This is just a bunch of text, right? So, so that means you, in order to be productive and effective outside of data science, you have to be able to communicate with people through the channels that they use using the documents and formats that they're used to. So you have to do that work, right? No one's going to learn Python so that they can speak to you about your report. I guarantee it. If they did, they'd be here. <laughs> so, all right. So this is a bad thing, right? It means you have to compensate for someone else's deficiency, except that you're a data scientist. I mean, like, <laughs> all right. So how do we do that? Well, I'm going to show you a different sequence of methods. And all of these notebooks will be available in Blackboard, so you'll have them for your own content. Um, so basically, I'm going to walk through uh, the idea of making a web page from Python. So mm -hmm. it's basically relies on the ability to uh, recognize the fact that HTML is just a string of characters. Python happens to be very good at manipulating strings of characters. And so that's all the idea there is. But what that gets us is once you can make a web page, a web page can be converted to a PDF. Right? More people are interested in PDFs than HTML pages, unfortunately. That's just the way of life. Make some reasonably pretty PDFs uh, from HTML pages. And then you can go through the process. I don't think I'll use this as a demo specifically, but you can take PDFs that other people have constructed, snip pages out of them, combine those snipped pages back into the reports that you have. Right? So you can do that all within Python. 
So if you've ever given, if, if someone has given you like a 100 page PDF, and you're like, I just want this one page to show up in my document, the lazy way is just to like take a screenshot of it and like paste it in as a picture. But I'm gonna show you actually how to merge that uh, PDF uh, file. All right, I'm gonna pull up the, All right, so I'm going to breeze through a whole bunch of PD, uh, Jupyter Notebooks. My request to you is that when you get confused, raise your hand. If it's just you and then you think, I'm so stupid, I don't understand what I've been saying, raise your hand. I will not make fun of you. I promise. All right, and I strongly bet that almost everyone else in the class would be like, oh, thank goodness. All right, so let's let's go through this notebook and make it a little bigger. All right, All right so I was just playing around with the sys library. It tells me what version of Python I'm running. I don't know why I was doing that. All right, so the, the magic here to create an HTML file is a, a language and a library called Jenga. So this is where the HTML is being produced. So as I sort of warned you, the HTML page if you're not familiar with it, don't feel bad. But basically, it's a set of tags. And you're going to treat that as a giant string. So that's cool. We can just print that. That's an HTML file. But the, the value add that Jenga provides is that it allows you to put in variables. So if you were thinking of an HTML file as just a set of characters, you don't know how to manipulate it other than manipulate it uh, as a string. But in Jenga, it means you can slip variables in. Now you have a, a, the ability to create templates. So you can make arbitrary HTML pages with different variables. OK, so simple example of that in Jenga is a whole bunch of magical commands. But the only thing that I want you to care about is the fact that I can take a variable from Python and put it in your HTML document. Now, this might not be immediately obvious why that would be useful. But if you're composing a monthly or weekly report that needs to be generated every month, right? the data is going to change. The customer typically wants the structure of the data in the report to be the same and consistent. So the way that this is manually done is someone opens up a Word document. They take last month's Word document. They delete all the data. Then they type it all back in. They hope to paste it in, maybe. Right? And then they take that Word document, and they save it as a PDF, and they email it to the customer. That's the manual process. But if you already know what your, rep rep what your report should look like, All right, so there's a whole sort of like stream of complexity that follows this idea because I just showed you the simplest thing you can do in Jenga, variable substitution. Now, obviously, Python has more than just variables with strings in them. So this is sort of like where we go off into crazy land. If this is the part where you get lost, that's fine. So basically, I'm going to specify a text file. This text file I call add a lamb .txt. This is like my monthly report. It's sort of the structure because all it has in it in that file is a variable with some string. So I can grab that template. Yeah, yes. Good question. So, cat, here I have an exclamation leading. With that, hmm? that exclamation point? Yeah. What is it? Yeah, that's what I'm going to get to. So, so, the exclamation point allows the rest of this command to be sent to my computer, not to Jupyter. So this is this command is being executed by my computer. That's what the exclamation point does. The cat is a computer command on my Mac that shows the contents of a file. So all I'm doing is basically printing the contents of this file from my computer by escaping out of Jupyter. So this is a it's called a cell magic in Jupyter. It's a way that so so the the power there is you can have a Jupyter notebook that runs commands on your computer. You don't have to like interface through Python to do like it just goes directly to your computer. Good question. All right, so going back to my little story, I had a library, I had a, a text file with some Jenga template language in it, and obviously I can take a string and substitute that into my text file. 
and I printed out, and it's Mary had a little lamb. So my monthly report is who had a little lamb, Mary had a little lamb. That's pretty straightforward. Hopefully. Now I have a slightly more advanced structure. I'm going to take a, a similar template. I have a text file with these curly braces for Jenga. That's a Jenga syntax thing. And I can work with dictionaries. Everybody likes dictionaries because they're way more powerful than just straight up string variables, right? So dictionaries are a more complicated structure. And the way that I can manipulate those in Jenga is I just have a, a dictionary name and then the key. So again, you don't need to memorize any of this, but the point is you can use Jenga with Python data structures to render content. So again, I'm going to add a little then dictionary.txt as my template. I'm going to create a dictionary. The dictionary has two keys and two values. So then when I render that that dictionary into the template, it says Frank had a little dog. All right, we're getting somewhere. This is the part where I expect to lose everyone, so don't feel bad at this point. So let's say I had a snippet of HTML code that shows up all over the place. I don't want to have to retype that HTML code the same time over and over. Like often, I'll have a title in my HTML page that's the same for all pages. But I would just want to make that once. Again, that's back to the laziness principle. So I'm going to have a, a file called header.html. It has a variable in it. And it's not a complete HTML page. It's just a little snippet of HTML. So not too surprisingly, um, what we're going to do is we're going to embed that template into another template. So this is where the, the craziness comes, right? We can inherit code from other templates. This is where you start building up the complexity. Don't need to worry about this, other than to take away the fact that you can construct very complicated reports. And why does that matter? Because if, <laughs> if you showed up with a PDF that just like, here's a list of names, people are like, how did you, you just type that in? That's so lazy. It doesn't even look professional. For whatever reason, people care about professionalism. I don't, I don't get it. But if you want something to look pretty, the professionalism usually means having fancy data structures laid out in a visually intuitive way. And that means having to work with like complicated structures like that. So that's just a little demo. All right. And there's like a little, here's all the things you can do in Jenga. Jenga happens to show up in other places. So it's sort of like a useful templating language. It shows up in a program called Ansible, which I won't reference outside of this, but there's a lot of places that Jenga shows up. So, and then this is, this little last example is, here we've got the inheritance from the file that we were looking at earlier, and we can construct a list. So rather than typing in, a bunch of list elements. We can have a for loop that loops over all those. And then when we create our HTML page, it has a list in it. But I didn't type that in. I used a for loop. All right. So I wasn't seeking you to get too excited, just laying some foundational work for this next part. All right. uh, let's see. I forget which one. This one. So I'm going to close that. Um, all right, so this notebook is uh, on getting an HTML document to a PDF. This is now where the, the rubber meets the road, right? We just made a bunch of HTML files. Now you're like, oh, whatever, no one uses HTML. But people do use PDFs. And making PDFs from Python is where it's at. All right, let's see if we can get this from. Yeah, so the library is called XHTML to PDF. Let me get to that. A little bit. All right. So then I'm just going to go through it. There's a bunch of boilerplate here that basically sets up the, the, the conversion process. I'm not going to worry about too much about that, other than to show you this. So I've got some HTML code. Again, this is just a static little HTML snippet. It could have been something complicated that we generated from Jenga. That's why I showed you the previous part. So whatever HTML you've generated, now you can take that and you can throw it into your PDF creator from HTML. So let's see what that did. Uh, if I can open this up. Yeah. Um, 
And you're like, Ben, that's so boring. I totally agree. We should go back in the Jenga and make it more complicated and look pretty. No? <laughs> Got one, no. All right, so all of this did, did is it took this, this simple little HTML file, which said basically, this is the body of the HTML document, start a new paragraph, here's some string, and then I close everything out. And that shows up as a PDF. Amazing. So anything that you can make into an HTML web page, you can make into a PDF. And we just showed how to make very complicated HTML documents. Good stuff. I do have another notebook here called Wheezy, but I don't use it as much, so. What's my next? I had one more thing here, I think. So, right, so so I, I think your question is, let's say it's that monthly um, report that you're generating, and it's the first of the month, so I need to generate a report. That's the basic question. Right, so the, the, way, so the way I would handle that situation, which is a very good question, I've written this whole notebook, do I really want to open this notebook every month and press like compile and then like mail it up? No, I don't even want to be there, right? I'd rather be on the beach. And so how do we do that? So the, the purpose of the Jupyter Notebook, in my opinion, is to do exploration, proof of concept. Once you've got a proof of concept that works and you're happy with it and it's reliable and you debugged it, and you've got something stable and you want to put it repetitive. So I would take this Jupyter Notebook and there's a Jupyter command called Jupyter to um, Python, and it just converts from a Python notebook to a py file. And therefore, you don't need to start Jupyter to run the Python script. So you've basically taken Jupyter out of the loop and made it just a pure Python script. That's like a one-step conversion process. And then, so it depends now whether I'm Linux or Windows or Mac. So on Windows, there's a thing called scheduled tasks. Has anyone here not heard of scheduled tasks in Windows? We got one. All right. So a few people have not heard of this. In Windows, built in on every Windows computer is a thing called scheduled task. It's fantastic. It will make your life so much better. Because you know what it does? It schedules tasks. Right? So first of the month, first Monday of the month, every second Wednesday of the month, whatever your schedule is, Windows uh, task manager can or Windows scheduler can, can handle that. So I would take the Python script that I've just generated, and I'd say, Windows Task Scheduler, please run this Python script every first of the month. Right? Set it and forget it. Walk away. As long as the computer is on, which is another problem, as long as the computer is on, the Windows task will execute, and then the Python script will run, and your report will be generated. So that's almost good enough. The one missing step is, how do I get it to the customer? I have to email it, right? I have been, the secret, this is a foreshadowing. Thank you for the question, Mother. Foreshadowing, there'll be a notebook on how to send emails. Mm -hmm. Oh, we got the whole thing in the bag, right? We got HTML, we got HTML PDF. We've got PDFs in the email, email being sent, Windows Task Scheduler, boom. Mm -hmm. On Linux, it's called Contab. It's a little more complicated, but it's also cool. All right, does that answer the question? Yeah. Good. OK, so we've got the whole workflow laid out. We've got, <laughs> our life is gonna be so good from here. See, I forgot anything else. Uh, all right, I'm gonna skip over the merge PDFs. It's pretty straightforward to take. I'll just show you the quick content here. It's really straightforward, in my opinion. So you've got this PDF, Pi PDF2, and you take in, I mean, like, literally, this is the notebook, right? You take, the library, you call this merger variable, and then you say merger out of 10, and you say this is the PDF I want. The first one, I'm going to read it in. I'm going to have another PDF, I'm going to append that. So you've got like document one, document two. Right? And then I just write that to this. I've merged two PDFs. That was easy. So what does that look like? Let's see if we can get over to there. Uh, yeah. Okay, so I don't have it run, so I'm actually have to run it quick. Let's see. I'm cleaning up everything. So I, I always try and say, like, nothing up my sleeve, right? So I've cleaned up all the PDFs. I just ran the notebook. So here I had the My Page Profile 22 PDF, and I had the Horizon Book 1 page template. So let's open up the merge PDFs 
result. Let's see if we can tell what happened. Okay, so we've got this thing going on. This is like a page. This looks like a similar page. And this is like a whole different thing going on. All right, so it's pretty clear we had two different PDFs merged together. From, uh, one and two are from one document. The third is from the other. It's really straightforward. Okay. I'm not saying this is the only way you would do that, but it might be convenient if you're slicing and dicing other. Yeah, so there's lots of libraries that do all these different things. These are just like standards that I use. So. Right, so we beat myself to the punch. It's sort of like the scheduled task. Those are pretty straightforward to accomplish. The other ones that are slightly harder to accomplish are the ad hoc reports. So these are basically event triggered. Right? So like every time this counter of paper documents gets above this high, do something. It is an event-based trigger. That you have to, so in order to have reports generated when there is an event, you have to have something measuring what that thing is. Right, so now you have a feedback loop, basically. You have an event being monitored. You have the code monitoring it that you wrote in Python. Right, and then you have, when the threshold is reached, send the report. Those are the two types. Okay. Well, <laughs> ad hoc may be on a request basis. Sure. So you're saying there's a three. There's ad hoc, trigger, event based. You know, it, that is not as unexpected, but it's something that is outside the realm. Mm, yeah, sure. So I think what you're saying is event based. Would that be? Well, it would be event based, but if you've got an example, that could be the threshold, and you've got to do something. Thresholds may or may not be predictable, yes. See? <laughs> well, it just depends on how to. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, semantics. All right. I appreciate feedback. Okay. So how am I doing? All right. So now we'll get into like how does that actually get implemented? Okay. So again, I'll go back to the office worker. The office worker is using Excel. Um, and, and your job is going to have to, so like, we just covered reports. Now we have a different task, which is the analytics, right? Someone writing reports. So this is now another work story for me. Um, I was meeting with a person who had been with a company for 38 years. That's amazing. That's a long career. Here's the bad news. They had one Excel spreadsheet that they've been maintaining for 38 <laughs> years. Can you imagine the complexity of that? No, that, that Excel spreadsheet is enormous, right? It has... It can like, it, and it does all these magical things, right? It can like generate tabs on the fly. They've written a bunch of, you know, BB script. They've got formulas all over the place, right? It's really complicated. <laughs> okay, and and I, it's it's amazing, right? The person would never consider themselves a data scientist. That's what like boggled my mind. They're they're an engineer, right? But they had this magic tool that's been developed over the course of their 38 year career, right? And I would totally consider that a very narrow application of data science, right? They had some data analysis tools embedded in that thing. And you know what my job is? I have to extract all the knowledge out of that notebook, <laughs> out of that Excel file. Anyways, that's a work story. So the problem is if you want, so if you just want to take that person's Excel file from them and like extract the value, that's cool. You can do that with pandas. More typically, and this is the sad part, is that person wants to continue using the Excel file. Right? So that means when you pull all the data out of their notebook, Pandas doesn't preserve the, the formulas, the formatting, the highlighting, the charts, right? all that knowledge that's in there. Huh? Yeah, yeah. So, so right. So, so if, if you all you want is a snapshot of that data, you can pull it out with Pandas. That's actually absolutely true. The problem, like, it gets more complicated because typically what you want to do is like, you take that you take that Excel file. You take the data out of it. You want to transform the data using Python. And then here's the hard part. Put the data back in the Excel file without disrupting the formulas or charts or formatting or highlighting or all the tabs. That's where the nightmare begins. Exactly. So, and, and this is for data at scale, right? Someone where they've got like tens of thousands of rows and columns and tabs and charts and formulas. 
So pandas, so our savior pandas is not going to help us in this situation. Pandas takes the data out in a numerical format and does not preserve formatting when it puts it back in. So that means we need a different tool. All right. Now hopefully I've set you up for a tool called OpenPyXL. Good stuff. So it does exactly what we need. It takes the formulas and the values and even, I think it is formatting also, all that stuff, it takes it into account. You can read and write to an Excel spreadsheet without damaging any of that intricate knowledge built into the Excel file. That's pretty amazing, right? Like all of that preservation on the both the read and the write. So that means, so if you can come in, you can be the magical data scientist who takes their notebook, analyzes it in Jupyter, and then writes the knowledge back into that same Excel file and give the person back the tool that they're comfortable using. That's the power. Because they can go back on using the environment they're comfortable with. You didn't disrupt their lifestyle. You didn't force them to learn Jupyter or Python, any of that stuff. They're still in that same tool. So that's pretty powerful. All right, let's see how that works. I can open it up. All right. All right, so I'm just going to show a little proof of concept. Uh, I have an Excel file here that's called week five in class activity.xlsx. And let's take a look at that before we get too far. Uh, yeah, I don't think, okay, so I, <laughs> this is like a little Ben story. I don't have Excel or Office installed on my computer, so you can't actually see it. Let's see if I can, uh, this might take a little bit of time. No, okay. So anyways, the, where I'm going with this is that there is actually uh, formulas in this notebook. Let's make that very explicit here. Right, in the Excel file, sorry. Uh, maybe this one. All right. So I use the Office Online, and it's got a formula. All right. So th this is the bad part, right? This is this is the danger that we have to overcome. So we've got this Excel spreadsheet with a bunch of numbers in it, and if you look in that D column, it's the average of A2 and B2. So the consequences for us, if we read this in Python, it won't preserve that. So it'll just have all the numbers. And then it gets worse because if we write any information back to the same Excel file or a copy of it or whatever, it won't have that formula. So that's the that's the problem we're trying to solve right now. Mm -hmm. All right. So I've got pandas and I load it in and I load the Excel file and I get the head of the data frame looks like that, which is awesome. I feel like I'm a data scientist. I've got a data frame. I'm using pandas in Jupyter. I, I'm writing this here, right? So now I do a, the transformation, right? And I can make a new column that is uh, B and C, the C times two. That's the new column. Right? That's a really straightforward computation, but we're going to do it anyways. Let's be explicit about what does that produce. Yeah, that head. Right, so now we've got a new column. And I think, I just provided my customer value. I'm going to send them back an Excel file. What could possibly go wrong? Right. The problem is, when you write that Excel file, it only has the numbers. And you've just lost all the institutional knowledge embedded in that Excel file. So I won't show you that, but trust me, you're going to do it yourself. Um, it does happen. All right, how do we get around that? So we're going to install OpenPyXL. In Conda, there's the, if you're in Conda, that's how you'd install it there. And after all that good stuff happens, we just import it. And you're gonna you're gonna like be a little fearful of what happens next, right? So basically, we're gonna get it's an unholy merger of Python and Excel. And it's just really hard to think about. So we've got we're loading in the Excel file into this WB 
So maybe it's just a variable I'm using called the workbook. So you have to learn some Excel jargon. The workbook is the Excel file, basically. And within an Excel file, there are worksheets. So I can access what are the sheets available in this workbook while well, there's one sheet. That's pretty straightforward. It's one of those tabs on the bottom of the Excel file. All right, so what are we going to do? Well, we're going to load in one of those sheets to a new variable called sheet. I'm very creative, by the way. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and then we're going to explore the data. All right, let's explore the data. So what's in row one's column one of the Excel spreadsheet? Now, this is where it's the unholy merger of Python and Excel, because in Python, things are indexed by zero, right? And Excel indexes by one. Oh, my goodness, right? Goodness and badness. All right, now, if, if I were in a cell and I wanted to ask what is the value, I ask what is the value, and I get back a value, right? So let's, let's remind ourselves of have that open yet. Mm, here we go. So remember, row one, column one is cell A1, and that had the word cool in it. So back in our notebook, we see it's cool. All right, so now we can do some, some Pythonic stuff. We can loop over a range of values from one to five, or one to four in this case for the echo output, and then print the row index and the value at that position. All right. So again, we'll just validate that cool nine, seven, 10 is what's in the Excel spreadsheet. So we have a pretty good way of handling access to the content of the notebook. Yeah, OK. So that's good. Now, all right. So now we can do something crazy. We can create a new worksheet. So this is a new tab in the Excel file. So, so this is not, <laughs> this isn't actually happening in our Excel file. It's only in the Python sort of data structure we're calling workbook. So it hasn't actually been saved to the Excel file. It's just a thing in Python's memory that we have a new sheet. OK, so now when we check that same workbook, we ask, what are the sheets? There's two of them. OK, that's good. Now let's do some more complicated stuff. Right, so I can take, take a new worksheet, and I can put up a value in row 2, column 2, column 3. I'm, I'm not being sort of like complicated. I'm just doing different things, right? And I, it's in memory. It's not written to the disk. I will get to that. Part. So, um, and I can also do crazy things like I can access the A1 cell, which is different than row one, column one, just because it's a different label for it, just the same position. And then I can put a formula in. Whoop, whoop. Right? Mm -hmm. Now we can go from formulas in Excel files to Python, and from Python to Excel formulas. And we can see the values that those formulas produce. We can see both the formula and the value in Python. So you can use the formula to Python to Excel. Exactly. <laughs> the squint is like, oh my god. Like, yes, that is true. All right. Oops, oops. Where did I get lost? Did I do this? Yeah. Yeah. Okay, I couldn't get that to work, but anyways. So we can do, if you're familiar with Excel, there are things called ranges. This is just accessing like a set of rows or columns or a whole block, right? And so mm -hmm. not surprisingly, mm -hmm. we can do a worksheet range, and it gets back a bunch of cells in what's called a tuple. It's sort of like a list, but different. So it's a tuple, right? So the thing that it's effectively, you're, you can access the zeroth element of that tuple. So now we're going back to Python indexing in zero, right? This is, this is the bad part. So your tuple is in. Python, so it's indexed by zero. So if I want to grab that first element from the list, but yeah. So so in Excel, I'm gonna go back to the Excel sheet. So in Excel, I have cells A, column A, row one. That's cell A one. The second thing here, which is nine, is in A two. So the range of cells from, what did we say? From A1 down to A5, I'm going to highlight where that is in the Excel file. So that's A1 down to A5. That's that thing. All right. So now, when I ask, like, show me the things in that range, it's returning uh, tuples of the cells. And I can access elements from the tuples. I can say, show me the zeroth thing. 
new Sorry? New worksheet. So I created a back up here. I had that same Excel file, but I created a new tab basically. All right, so let's make sure I executed this. Okay. Yes, yeah, so you can you can merge your data frame back into a worksheet. Okay, so now I've got a bunch of cells, and then I can operate on those. And so if I wanted to see what was in that tuple, I'd have to dig down because it's a bunch of nested tuples, and then I could ask what is the value of cell A1 in that list of tuples entries? A bunch of squinties. All right, so where was I going? I had, I had this cell range, and that cell range got me back a tuple, which for your purposes, think of it as a list. And that list, I had to access what is the zero element of my tuple, and that's also a tuple, so now I have to, it's a nested tuple, so now I have to say what's the zero element and the zero element of the tuple. That is actually the cell. Yeah, yeah. So the notice these nested parentheses, it's like a nested list. The first list element is a tuple. It's a little messy. Yeah, I was gonna say, why, why is that? Right, be, because what we asked, so let's let's see why that is, right? So let's say I just asked for a column. So it's returning to me a column. So let's now say I said I want A1 through B5. That would be a rectangle, right? So let's go back here. What does that look like? That looks like this. So it only returned one column. If we had returned just one row, it would also be a tuple of tuples. Right? So, so the OpenPy Excel is trying to handle the generic case of a rectangle. But in this case, the rectangle only had one column in it. So I'm going to execute this. It's going to look different. right? It's a tuple of tuples still, but it's now a rectangle. So is that example? Sorry? The result example one? Where are you? I'm not sure where you're looking. So these are the open PyXL data structures, which we can access. Let me just change this back for. So that that right there, that's Python telling you that there is an open PyXL data structure. So that module created a specific data structure called a cell. And the cell data structure is labeled by the sheet name and the cell position. So it's that, that square bracket thing that's like a structure that's specific to OpenPy Excel. And the value of that data structure is we can ask, hey, data structure, what is your value? And it contains a thing called value that we access. And now it, we, it reports back to us that there is a formula in that. Because up here, up here, we had set in that worksheet that A1 was the sum of one and one. Okay, so let's. And you created the sheet name as a Yes, that's right. Yeah. Good. Okay, so now we can go back and like we can set the cell values to be various values, right? And this is now the part where we're at before about. Is this in memory or is it on file? This last step here is where I'm going to save the workbook to a new Excel spreadsheet. So that's where it gets written. And we could either overwrite the file we had read in, or we could write a new Excel file. So that, that's a reasonable question. What, what April asked is, how do we take a tab that existed and make a new tab and put all the old content in the new tab, right? So we would open up, and I'm gonna walk through verbally. We'd open up the Excel spreadsheet. We'd see that there's one sheet name here, and that's a list with just one element in it. And then we would have to, basically I'm gonna skip down to this part. We'd, we'd grab all of the cells from the old worksheet We'd create a new sheet. So we'd create a new sheet. 
And then we'd say the new worksheet is equal to the old worksheet. And so we, we basically went back. I'm going to show visually what that looks like. So we'd just like copy all these cells and then save that as the entries in the new worksheet. So you can basically copy the things by element and then paste them in the new spreadsheet by setting the variables equal from the old sheet and the new sheet. Yeah. Yes, because they're operating on the data structure that's a cell from open by Excel. Yep. OK. Good questions. So now you've saved this. I, I typically recommend saving your work to a new spreadsheet so it doesn't overwrite the input that you were reading from. Because typically, your first time is not going to be the correct time. You have to do it a few times. Save it over there. Where is there? In the old Excel file. Yes. Yeah, so you could overwrite the old file with your new sheet. Yeah. Just save. Yeah. So now I'm gonna I'm gonna take this new so we just I, I didn't maybe show you this correctly, but we have back here this is the sheet. Let's see. So I just create let's look at the timestamp on this guy here. So new file was created at 847 on September 25th. We just created that file. That's fresh. So let's see what that looks like in Office. Upload. File. Cell manipulation, new file. So this is the file we just created. See the timestamp is 8.47. Won't break time. And when we get in here, hopefully, it's uploading and there's a new file. All right, so let's look in here in Excel and see what happened. So remember, this is, I've got the old sheet open and I've got the new sheet. All right, so I think, let's revisit. So it was called sheet one. And this is like a, a fun little game that I get to play with online Excel. It doesn't show the values until I, anyways, yeah. <laughs> That's an online Excel issue, I think. So, so anyways, <laughs> I apologize. So, absolutely, it was. Um, <laughs> so this is the old sheet, right? Sheet one is the original sheet. And notice that the formula is still there. So, so far, so good. All right. Now we created some new sheets. That one has a formula in it and a value. And that's that string that we put in. Nice. I don't even remember what's on example one. Bob's and a string. All right, whatever. All right, so we, 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 I didn't type any of that in. That was in Python. Python's good. All right. No? So, so, so when we. So we created a new file that had the old content in it, right? Sheet one is the undisturbed, you know, 38 years of work that I just had to, you know, not violate, right? So that has been untouched. All I did was added two new sheets with some formulas and values. You can also add just two sheets. Absolutely. Yeah. You certainly have write permissions back to the original data. Okay. Other questions? All right, so we're going to take a break, and then when we come back, there'll be an activity. <laughs> Did the eyebrows go? <laughs> okay. So let's come back at uh, 8.56.
Okay, so obviously we get to run another uh, random assignment or reconnect. All right, we got students. All right, so here are our pairs. So, so find your partner. Wait, is this the same? <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right, so find your partner, physically co-locate. So, so I, I will go back. One of you is the typer on the computer, so not, so you won't get to choose who's typing. I will choose for you. Can I get a pass? Okay, so you've got your partners. I'm going to go back to the other slide. Oh, yeah, so the, I forgot. The person who appeared first on the list, you're the typer. Everybody got that? The person who was first, so go back on this list. So that you get experience. <laughs> Yeah, so, so the, I'm intentionally breaking the model that the person with the most experience and the best typer and the best data scientist gets the computer and does typing. That's what I'm trying to break. So I will not allow you to choose who is typing on the computer. Right? The person who is first on the list is the typer. All right. That's the model. I mean, I have to think of ways to thwart your behavior. Basically, that's my game. Oh, wait, I didn't even go back. All right. Did I, oh, I didn't type this up. All right. I apologize. In Blackboard. I'll pull this up. Uh, let's go back. So under course materials. So in, you'll need to log into Blackboard, open up course materials, week five automation. It's a folder. Then you have this week five in-class activity with open Excel. You'll need to download it, open it up, do the activity in the notebook. So I'm wandering around not to see if you're doing the activity, but to see if you need help. So just like raise your hand, lay me down, I walk around.
was to sum the two columns. I did not tell you whether that I need that to be in a formula format or a value format. Okay. Is that clarification? So, so, so you could sum the two columns in an Excel formula, or you could just sum the two values in Python and then write the sum in Python to Excel. Thank you. 
happening. So 
Okay, so we have one more minute. Start wrapping it up with your partner. We'll come back to our desk. people are so engrossed that they don't want to stop. That's, that's a good thing.
All right. Where are we going next? Okay, so as I've been warning you or teasing you all night, there is going to be a demo of sending email from Python. I know you're all very excited. Um, so, so again, just to reemphasize, why do we care? I mean, I'm going to have to read the email anyways, right? Not necessarily. I don't have to read emails, right? If someone sends me an email and I know what they're going to send me and I know what my response is going to be, you know what you can do? You can write a Python script that reads your email and composes a response. If it's that predictable, you should automate it, right? So, so, and get this. So remember the fact that the whole idea of we were using PDFs, HTML files, making reports, right? How do we how do we integrate that? Oh, oh, emails have attachments, so we can send emails with attachments. All right, I'm not going to do the attachments tonight, but it's I have shown people how to do that. It's very straightforward. All right, let's go over to demo. Email. Oops, week five. Where's my email? All right, so first I'm going to show you something that doesn't work. It's the right thing to do. All right. So first I have the old school method. So back when we had to send email through servers, we used a protocol called SMTP, Simple Mail Transfer Protocol. I got a couple head nods. How many people have not heard of SMTP? Okay, most of the class, right? So all this is, it's a product. So like back in, I think, lecture two or three, we had like how to get data, right? So you're a client, you have a server, you have to send data back and forth. There's a language those things speak. You're sending emails or you're sending web pages. Those are different protocols. So there's a protocol for sending web pages. There's a protocol for sending email. The simple mail transfer protocol is the one you use for email. So we're going to go over a Python library called SMTP lib. What could it possibly do? Send emails and receive emails. All right. So we're going to set up a connection using SMTP lib to a server called smtp.gmail.com. Huh, I wonder what server that is. It's the SMTP server for Gmail. And it operates on a certain port that we've submitted. All right. So not too surprising so far. You should not be lost. And then we have to speak server language. This is this is a little bit confusing, and I don't expect this isn't the data scientist thing. This is like a Ben Pin thing, right? So like, I speak SMTP for a reason. So, so you send the server a special command called hello. This is a misspelling of hello, right? But it's the server protocol for establishing a new connection. So when I send the server hello command to a connection, Gmail replies to me in the special SMTP language. Isn't that that's like I just uh, like, that's near and dear to my heart, right? I just talked to Gmail servers through a computer, and it wasn't, you know, as like right through Python. All right, so what's going on here? Uh, Gmail says smtpgmail.com at your service, comma. Here's your IP address and uh, the size of the message and a bunch of other stuff. Whatever gobbledygook. All right, but that's cool, right? SMTP server from Gmail welcomed us. Question. Uh, the port number is a secure port that Gmail uses for secure SMTP transfers, so that it's not plain text. I think that's all they have. I can't testify that that's the only thing they have open, but it's the one that is working. So, yeah, so Gmail doesn't expose insecure access to their email. All right, so again, back to that. So there's a good leading question, by the way, because the next command that I have to send is say start TLS. So that that initial server hello, that was plain text, right? But now we're saying, hey, Gmail, can you set us up a secure link so that we don't communicate where other people can see what we're typing? And so we start the TLS, and then Gmail replies to me. It says favorably, ready to start here. <laughs> this is exciting. You've talked to a computer in the computer's language. That's cool. All right. All right, blah, blah, blah. So now I'm going to get, get back a slightly different message. All right. So, so now I'm going to send my email and password to the server over secure link. 
Sounds reasonable, right? All right, so normally, if you weren't interacting with Gmail, it would actually work. So I get a SMTP, SMTP authentication error, as Python complaining about that issue. And we look down here, blah, 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 look at the bottom of the message. It says, SMTP, SMTP authentication error, port five, 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 message 30, 535, username and password not accepted, learn more at blah, 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 here's a link. So the Gmail SMTP server says, we actually don't accept passwords over SMTP. <laughs> now, that's because Gmail is so popular that people like me would automate a script to interact with Gmail. <laughs> right? So, so Gmail went around and locked down their services, so you can't even log in with a username and password. Now, I will show you in the next Jupyter Notebook how to actually send Gmail emails. So that is a solved problem in the next notebook, but I'm going to continue on as though I had successfully logged in. So if I were using a different server for SMTP, like some other servers, um, less popular probably, I would actually be able to send an email this way. So it's a very straightforward. You just say, here's the from, here's the to, here's the, the server, we're gonna send the email, and, we put, and here's the message. So it's, it's pretty straightforward. Uh, that's all there is. So SMTP is pretty straightforward. Nothing unsurprising. Gmail. So now we're going to switch to an actual uh, Gmail interface. And you'll notice it's way more complicated because they really want to make sure that the person sending the email is the person they say they are. They really have authenticated with that account, not just with a password. So I don't know if you've ever logged into Gmail and it asks you, like, here's a text message. Did you get the text message? That's the sort of thing that we're trying to automate through Python. So I had to go through this long, arduous process of setting up my Python notebook to have that two-factor authentication enabled with a plain text token in JSON. So all of that has been set up behind the scenes for you. So I'm going to walk through this notebook, but just know that all of that has already taken place. I did that, OK? And all of the code is here, so you can do that. April. But not all mail services. Exactly. But I feel like mail.com or um, Well, name an unpopular one. What? Name an unpopular one. Yeah, because so the popular ones have to be very defensive to prevent spam. So like if you're a spammer, what you want to do is automate that login process and create as many accounts as you can. So the popular ones are all very defensive, right? If you're a small SMTP server used by like people, you, you just let people log in with the username and password. So mail.com. <laughs> well, if you've heard of it, then the answer is probably yes. Well, but I mean, I, I work in anti fraud, so like you look at spooky guys all day long. Yes. So that's a popular one for fraud. Because probably the protections are not as good as Google. Yeah. That's what I would say. Yeah. So, 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 not all, so not all corporations have the security people and infrastructure to protect their infrastructure well. So again, the scale typically matters of the organization. And there's other factors that come to that. But so for small services, or maybe you can try mail.com. Maybe you can log in over SMTP with a plain password. That would be something that's trivially, it's very easy to automate over Python. So that's probably why you're seeing them in the spam. Gmail, it's much more locked down. All right, so <laughs> the thing you'll notice when I'm using, I'm just going to go through Gmail here. They happen to have two packages that you have to install in Python to work with Gmail. Like they have this API client that you have to install for Python. So that's sort of like, how much work did they spend to have an engineer or a team of engineers or multiple teams of engineers write this application and make it very secure? It's pretty expensive. Okay. Once I've got those libraries installed, I run my standard import statements to call the libraries I just installed. And then this is where I need to leave. So I've got this little reminder here myself. Stop. And that's because I have to go off and run an external Python script that logs into the Gmail servers, gets back a token, verifies everything. That's the two-factor authentication I was talking about. I've embedded that Python script in the text here as a raw comment. So you can actually just do that yourself. And this is the command that I ran to log into Gmail and get two-factor authentication set up. Now, it's a little dangerous. And, and here's the reason it's dangerous. I've accepted the fact that a Python script now has complete control of read and write and delete and change all my emails. And so I have something like 10 years worth of emails in Gmail. And so I now have unleashed Python into my in my inbox. 
So I could accidentally run a command that would delete everything. I just gave it permission to do that, which is why it's sort of like a, you should know what you're diving into here. Okay. Blah, blah, blah. So I got all that. And, and now I get into a little bit of more wonky email stuff. The text in an email, uh, when we were using SMTP, that library was handling it for us, handling this aspect for us. But all of the content in your email is what's called base64 encoded. So it takes like a string like this and converts it into a different string that looks like this. So it's what it's trying to do is uh, compress data and make sure that like if a bit changed, it'd be more noticeable in base64. So there's just it's a little bit of encoding to change it into something that is suited for email back when uh, the the transmission was less reliable. Okay, so I'm gonna make this is all stolen from Gmail. I didn't write any of these functions. So there's a big old function here that basically sends. This should look similar to the SMTP library to show. It's basically the to from subject and text. And so now I'm gonna create a message. I'm calling that function. I'm just sending it all the basic stuff. And that function is going to return back to me this base64 encoded script. So don't worry too much about it. The point is, yeah, before I actually, uh, let's see. So here's a function that will actually send the message. That's the thing that communicates out with Google services. Again, I didn't get this function. It's just something I stole from Google. So I'll send that. And this is where I tell now the, the library, this is where my token is. It's that two-factor authentication stuff. Again, there's lots of overhead here. So before we go too far, I'm going to get my Gmail. Hopefully there's nothing bad here. So there's a bunch of messages. There's a couple of unread messages at top. This is me saying there's nothing up my sleeve, right? My email box has nothing unusual in it. Okay, Put that in your mental picture box. So now I'm going to send a message. That's the, the final step in this whole process. And let's see if it gets me. Look at that. <laughs> All right, so this is, a, this is like an anticlimactic, right? We just sent the email to ourselves from Python through Gmail, which shouldn't be that hard, but there was a lot of overhead. And you'll have that notebook, so now you can send email from your account to anyone else in the world in Python. I, I'm sure that's possible. I haven't played with it. I don't have an Outlook account. Yeah. Okay. So, anyways, that's all. All that to say. I did all the, 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 the messaging and the, and the definitions and all that good stuff, so it's there. You can use it. Yes. Yeah. All right, so that's enough of that email. All right, so here's the, the I think, the last so like, this is the whole sequence, right? Like, we built HTML, PDF, emails. Last thing is we can send uh, text messages from Python. How do we do that? So has anyone done that already? Okay. All right. So from Python. <laughs> right. So if you have an email address, you can email to an SMS gateway, and that SMS gateway will send the text message in the content of that text. So this means now you have the ability to send email messages from Python, and you can email to a text message. So therefore, you can text message from Python. All right. In the interest of time, I'm going to skip over the well, there's a little bit of extra here of like, how do I know when? And then like, what's the investment worth, right? Like there's a bunch of, I have to do right. I have to write all these Python scripts. Is it really worth it, right? I just did this once a month. It's not that much work. And so there's a whole trade-off table analysis. Um, and then, uh, all right, so we'll skip over that. So basically we covered all these things. I've said it many times. The last little bit here that I skipped over was the fact that you can audit, if, if all the things I showed you don't work, you can at least automate a web browser interaction. If all else fails, that will almost always work. That means like you're moving the mouse and you're pressing keys without using your hands. So I'll, I'll, I'll think to some videos on that just to show what that means. The library there is called Selenium. You can control Selenium from Python. So that means you can control how your computer interacts with a web browser from Python. Moving the mouse around, clicking on things, it's pretty neat to watch. Because like the first time you see it, you're just like, that's inhuman. Mm -hmm. Yes, it's actually a computer. Okay. The last bit, um, this is how I got my start in computing. I spent uh, a few years installing computers. So that means like putting the CD in the tray, 
sitting there while the computer formats, and then installing about 40 applications and then giving it to the user. That's a repetitive task once you've done it about 200 times. And the bad thing is, once you've done it 200 times, you've invariably screwed up one of those little steps. So I spent some time, I automated that, and then I got the, the installation time down from like two days down to like a few hours. So I automated all of those steps and made my job way better. And how did your bosses They were very happy because a consistent image is much better than something that I've screwed up. All right, so this is, uh, sorry for running over a little bit. Uh, you can leave if you want, because this will all be on video. So this is a problem that I had to solve, where I have a Excel spreadsheet. It has two sheets in it. Those sheets have formulas and values in it. I want to basically put the values and columns and rows from one sheet into the other. But there's some overlap. So some of the entries in the initial sheet also show up in the other sheet. So it's not simply a copy of the second sheet into the first sheet. It's a sort of like conditional copy of certain rows and columns. OK, so that will be available. Um, and so this is some, pro, some, some tips, like this is the instructions. And these are sort of the tips uh, that you should expect. And then, as usual, I advise you to use paper to start this process. Do not start typing. Use paper. I think that's it. Oh, yeah. And you have a little uh, three question survey response anonymous on your sheet, on your desk. So turn that in before you leave, and I'll take your name to